Hello, my name is CJ Wren, and today I'm going to be covering two simple scenarios as jazz arrangers and jazz composers that we can utilize voice crossing in our writing. If you do any sort of instrumental composition, you'll find some useful tips in this video, so make sure you stick around, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell, leave a like, and let's get on with the video. The first scenario we will be talking about is when writing for our full brass section, and we have our lead trumpet down in the staff, which is pushing our trumpets down kind of into trombone tape territory. How do we write so our trombones don't also get pushed down into the staff, which can create a muddy harmony compared to having our trombone 1 and 2 playing just above middle C. The second scenario we will look at is when writing for a group of instruments that are playing eighth note lines, such as a sax soli or a trumpet ensemble feature. When writing for those groups of instrumentations, we want to be careful about avoiding repeated notes because that's not something the player necessarily is comfortable playing. It might mess up the articulation and the style because they'll stick out of the texture if they have to articulate while everyone else is slurring, we will look into how voice crossing is an answer to repeated notes. The first concept we're going to talk about is dovetailing. This is very simple. All it is is crossing our trombone one above our trumpet four when we're voicing for our full brass section. The reason we would want to do this is because we need to compensate for our low trumpet range. Specifically, look here at trumpet one and notice that we have a D, a concert pitch D, which is still in the staff for our trumpet player if we were to look at it in transposed pitch. What's important about this is we kind of think about our typical lead trumpet range as being from G above the staff up. That's obviously not universally true, but when we start to voice a little lower towards C in the staff, we need to be conscious about how low our other instruments will get below that. What happens if we voice something too low, it gets muddy. So here's a quick example just on a piano of what what sounds muddy and what doesn't. For example, here's this A flat major seven chord, but I'm going to voice it all below middle C. Listen to this and listen how it doesn't necessarily sound as clean as we would prefer. Let's compare this to a better voicing where we spread out our voices a little more and everything just sounds a little more clear. Essentially, the lower our voices are, the larger we want to spread them out, and then as we get towards middle C, up until G above the treble clef staff, things can be pretty dense in there, but then typically we like to expand out again because that helps add stability for a brass when we're voicing up top. That's not universal because there's different circumstances, such as with cluster chords where that doesn't apply, but in general, it's good to have large intervals in the lower part of our voicing. We can get pretty tight in the middle and then expand out again. That principle applies to the voicing I have right here because you'll notice the trumpet is lower, so it's pushing my bottom trumpet down, but that means I would be pushing my trombone 3 further down if I wasn't dovetailing trombone 1 and 4, meaning trombone 1 is actually above trumpet 4. Let's listen to this voicing and then understand what parts of the harmony I'm choosing to use for my dovetailing. Now let's listen to this voicing. So while I have the chord notated as a C minor 9, I actually voice this chord in my brass as a C minor 11 to add a little more color. Let's start by breaking down and labeling what parts of the harmony are in the trumpets and work our way all the way down to the bass trombone. Our trumpet 1 is the 9 of our C minor 11. Let's keep working our way down. We see trumpet 2 is the 7, trumpet 3 is the 5th, trumpet 4 is the 3rd. What's good about my voicing here is that everything is voiced in thirds and having this nice equally spaced simple harmony makes it a very stable chord and it solidifies our extension on the top of our harmony. Now let's take a look at the trombones that are participating in this voicing. Trombone 1 is our 11, trombone 2 is our 9, trombone 3 is our 7, and the bass trombone is playing the root but it's playing it down an octave and that helps stabilize the chord and it also sounds great. So dovetailing in this circumstance specifically enabled me to add another extension to my harmony in trombone 1 and making this a minor 11 chord. The strategic decision I was making for why I wanted trombone 3 to be my 7 is because there's a couple generally good accepted voicings for our bass trombone versus our trombone 3. One such example is having the root in the bass trombone and then whatever 7 it is for that chord in trombone 3, that's a pretty solid voicing and enables us to build on top of that with stability. Since we decided we want to have trombone 3 playing that B flat and with the combination 
of our trumpets being low here, and they could be low for a multitude of reasons, such as this being a softer passage, and they should be lower so they can play at a softer dynamic with ease. The combination of our lower trumpets and our trombone 3 sitting here means we have to voice trombone 1 and 2 in between trumpet 4 and trombone 3. The key word there is being in between because as we establish with this technique of dovetailing, we are allowed to voice trombone 1 above trumpet 4 and that will lead to opportunities for more extensions or harmony as well as putting trombone 1 in a better range for a lead trombone player. And quickly to recap, we want to keep our trumpets equally spaced because it'll make it simpler for them to hear as a section and play that with confidence since they won't have that major second or minor second rub against two instruments. The next technique we will talk about is actually just like dovetailing but even simpler. So dovetailing had us put trombone one above trumpet four but overlapping is simply having trombone one double trumpet four. Once again, this is an effective technique to work with trumpets that are a little lower in the register without us having to push down our trombones while preserving our instruments, outlining our important tones such as the guiding tones and our color tones. That principle is very important in this voicing as well as our previous voicing because trombone three could have just have played the fifth, but I personally feel that having the root against the fifth and on the bottom of our harmony, while it is stable, I think it will actually detract from the color of our overall harmony. Now let's listen to this overlapping harmony versus our dovetailing harmony and how they resolve. We're going to analyze both of these chords and pick them apart and talk about some of the decisions I made while voicing them. So first, this is a C7 flat 9 presented to us in this bar. Our trumpet 1 is playing the flat 9, trumpet 2 is playing the 7, trumpet 3 is playing the 5th, trumpet 4 is playing the 3rd, trombone 1 is doubling that 3rd, trombone 2 is playing the flat 9, trombone 3 is playing the 7, and once again we have the root in our bass trombone. To preserve that interval of our minor seven between our bass trombone and trombone three i opted to keep my trombone three on that b flat and since our trumpets are in a similar range as before just adjusting for the harmony here i cut them spaced in thirds just as i was talking about with my previous principle in our other voicing that meant we had to deal with trombone two and trombone one and how they fit in between trombone three and trumpet four this was an easy decision to make because i also voiced trombone three two and one in thirds from each other and that automatically put trombone one overlapping the same part of the harmony as I have in trumpet four. That is perfectly okay to do because if you think about these two ensemble units, they are standing together and these are sitting together and this section right here serves as the glue between these two ensemble units. Let's listen one more time to this so we can now focus on our resolution at the F minor nine. Let's label all the parts of this harmony this brass section is playing here so we can understand the dovetailing in the decisions for this voicing. Up top we have the fifth and that's because it's the natural resolution point of our flat nine in the previous chord. Trumpet two is playing the third, trumpet three is playing the nine, trumpet four is playing the seven, trombone one is actually playing the root, trombone two is playing the fifth, and trombone three is playing the third. That leaves us with the bass trombone also playing the root. Digging into this chord a little bit, let's look at the bass trombone versus trombone three. What's happening in this circumstance is they're actually a third apart plus an octave. That is a tenth, and a tenth is an interval that I refer to a lot because I think it's one of our most stable intervals, just like the sevens that we were using for our other voicings. This also follows the principle I was talking about earlier about spreading out our voices down low, getting dense in the middle, and then spreading out towards the top. Let's now investigate our trumpets and we'll find that this is a little different than some of my other voicings. Notice in the middle I have a second and I was talking earlier about how I did not like to have seconds in my trumpets but that's okay in the middle of these voices because they have the stability of the note on the bottom versus the note on the top so when they have this tight harmony it'll make sense to them when they're playing in context. This once again influences 
was the placing of our trombone two and trombone one. I opted to put trombone two on the fifth because it's a third from my trombone three, and that left me choosing to either double trumpet four or go to my root in trombone one. I chose to go to the root because it was already playing the E natural, so it made sense for it to resolve upwards since trumpet four was already resolving downwards. We still have one more scenario we're going to talk about for voice crossing, but notice it's very effective to use voice crossing in our brass instruments, even though that goes against our common thinking about how trumpet one down to trombone four should be stacked in order. We can break those rules and it can have some very positive side effects. Now let's look at using voice crossing to get rid of repeated notes. Let's listen to this short little section I wrote for a sax soli so we can get it into our ear. I went ahead and labeled the repeated notes, but now we need to talk about why repeated notes are bad, especially in this sort of setting with eighth note lines. For this example, I switched over to transposed view, and let's take a look at trumpet two down here where we have a repeated note that doesn't quite make sense. Just looking at this, if you were playing this on tenor, you would have to articulate this note, but that will stick out of the texture because everyone else is slurring. On top of this note making an RO difference because of the articulation, having this line as tenor two is just kind of a kick in the teeth at some point because tenor two does have a lot of the inner parts that are more challenging and it might not have the most exciting line compared to alto one so giving us repeated notes almost makes it feel like we're playing something less important to remedy this repeated note we're simply going to take advantage of voice crossing between one of our adjacent instruments in this case take a look at tenor one playing that g that can become the e of tenor two or tenor two plays the G. That eliminates our repeated note in this little section right here. Now take a look here in tenor one. We have repeated note there and that's also going to be awkward to play for all the same reasons. We can simply solve this by swapping these two notes. Let's make our tenor two play the E and let's make our tenor one play the C. While that solves our repeated notes in that section, and that actually gives us something more engaging for our specific players to be playing, look at our pickup to this section and notice it's just a little awkward to have this jump from this B flat to E. While it's not technically challenging, it's nicer to have more scalar patterns. What this means is I would also opt to swap out tenor two to play what tenor one was playing, and then tenor one can play what tenor two is playing, and then by the time they get to the end of this bar, they're back in their rightful place in their hierarchy. Now when we listen to this bar, of course nothing is going to physically change. Except that our players will enjoy what they're playing just a little more. Now, all repeated notes are not created equal. Let's look right here and notice that we have a repeated figure. That's okay because that repeated figure is articulation driven. Also, since it's not a line of notes that is definitely benefiting from having the scale or pattern, it's okay to leave it as a repeated note because it actually has an effective sound that we're trying to achieve. To solve our last repeated note problem, I actually jump back to concert pitch because we're working between our tenor one and our alto two. Look here on beat four of this measure in this triplet figure, we have a repeated note here. And then we have repeated note in tenor one crossing the bar. Both of those are going to be fairly awkward to play, but especially this one. Our simple fix, once again, is to utilize voice crossing. Simply make alto two be playing the tenor one note and switch our tenor one note to our alto two note. This solves our repeated notes both in this bar and crossing into the downbeat of the next bar for our tenor one. The final result of eliminating repeated notes using our voice crossing is to say that voice crossing is good. And even though it breaks some unspoken rules about the hierarchy of parts, especially if we're voicing within those specific units of instruments in our big band, it's still okay to cross your voices. It's better to preserve the line and is better to preserve the player's interest than it is to preserve that hierarchy of notes all the time in your score. If you have more questions about voice crossing and have any specific questions about the voicings I was putting in this video, please ask them down in the comments. I hope you enjoyed what I was presenting to you today and enjoy this new type of video which was talking about compositional concepts. I have more Dorico videos as well as composition type videos coming out soon, so make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and leave a like. I appreciate your support and Thank you for watching CJRN Music.